Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about Pulumi and infrastructure as code, uh, which I realize might be kind of a weird topic to discuss at a JavaScript meetup, but I promise to you there will be JavaScript and there will be good reasons to go over it. Because after all, you know, when we're building our applications with JavaScript, turns out that most of the time we have to host it somewhere. And so Pulumi is a pretty nice tool to do that. So let's kind of dive in. So I'm hoping to answer three main questions for you guys today. What is infrastructure as code? Why should you care about it? And what do I mean when I say real, as you saw in my title? So what is infrastructure as code? I mean, quite simply, it's the art of managing and provisioning your hosting infrastructure, your databases, your serverless functions, your web applications, whatever it might be, through code rather than doing it by hand, which is historically how we've done it in the past. Because back in the old days, that was it. There wasn't much automation. There weren't many tools for this. And so you had to do everything by hand. If you needed a serverless function, let's say, you're going to go in the Cloud Console. You're going to start clicking things. You're going to start typing things. You're going to pray you're doing the right thing. What if you need a database or storage? Same thing. More clicking, more typing. And so let's see a little bit of that in action. So this, uh, these demos are mostly going to be AWS kind of focused, but um, there's no real requirement that this has to be AWS. Uh, Pulumi is pretty agnostic when it comes to providers. Um, we'll, we'll see later when we go over their ecosystem that there are quite a lot of them for all sorts of clouds, even non-clouds, your GitHubs. There's a lot of things you can actually provision uh, with Pulumi. So what we're going to do is that we've got a little static web up here. And let's just bring it up here, just take a look at what it's like. Pop it open. So this is really just the Vite React starter, nothing special. We got a little button here with a little bit of a counter. You can click it a couple of times, the number goes up. Sweet. So now we want to host it somewhere. So our immediate choice right now is really just going to be S3. Um, if you're not familiar with what, with what S3 is, it's really just um, storage within the cloud. Um, for all sorts of files, it could be a static web app, it could be your um, yeah, I don't know, your order imports, your exports, whatever it might be, basically uh, S3 and the buckets that separate these are what you're going to want to reach for. And so I'm not actually going to create the bucket that you see here to host this app, um, because truth be told, I don't remember how I created it. Um, it's actually kind of complicated to get a bucket to be public. You have to configure policies a certain way. It's kind of a headache, and I don't remember what I did. And as you'll see, there will be a solution to that later. All right, so what we're going to do is upload all the files. Actually, before we do that, let's make sure we actually build our app. Let's just run build. And we'll see it's going to spit out a couple of disk files. We see we got an index file, a couple of assets. Let's upload all of these. So we're going to add some files. I'm going to go out one directory because I need these guys. Then we're going to add our disk or our assets folder and upload that. Yes, we do want to upload. And then we scroll down if it lets me scroll. Jeez, uh, this actually might be complicated because I can't see the upload button. So it is at the bottom of my web browser. Let's go live demos. There we go. All right, we're uploading. All right, we're gonna close the upload. And we can see that our files are now uploaded. Let's take a look at our index HTML, pop it open. And now we can see that our static web app is now hosted in AWS. Pretty cool. Why should, should you care about this? Well, generally, when we build our applications, we're probably not building simple apps. Most of the times, we have real applications that are pretty complex with multiple services. You know, we might have databases. We might have potentially multiple applications if we're doing microservices. And so, if you don't have that, just toss it on your cell, call it a day, right? You don't. You probably don't need infrastructure as code tools. You can get by with offerings from from your cell and the like, you know. But clearly, as we just saw, the manual approach has problems. How is that setup done? I don't have a clue how I created that bucket. I just don't remember. And so what if somebody else is creating things for you and they forget? That could be pretty bad. How long would it take if you had to recreate your hosting infrastructure? Uh, what if you had to duplicate it? Let's say you've got a dev environment, a QA environment, a production environment, right? You've got to multiply the time spent to set up the infrastructure by each environment. And then, God forbid, if somebody accidentally deletes something, how long would it take you to recreate it? 
And then of course, human error, right? I might typo something, somebody else might typo something. There's a lot that can go wrong when you're manually provisioning things uh, in the cloud. And then of course, if we're victims of compliance and regulations, sometimes you also have to keep track of who did what, who actually created that infrastructure, when did they do it, how did they do it? Uh, if you're lucky, your cloud provider might actually have an audit log for you, but if not, well, then you gotta make sure that you recorded it yourself. So, Santa Mines came to the rescue with a very simple idea. Let's store the infrastructure as code. Just like we build our applications as code, we host them in Git repos, let's do the same thing. Because we get then the benefits of source control, right? There's our audit log. We've got the Git history that we can look at and we can see who changed what and when. And then we get the benefits of pull requests and code review. Somebody can now review a change to the infrastructure and make sure that it's doing the right thing before it's actually performed. And it becomes easily repeatable. Just as you can copy paste a div on an HTML page, you can copy and paste your infrastructure code and you can easily get multiple environments up and running. So, what do I mean by real in my, in my title here? So, in order to kind of understand that, we're going to have to go back to what, are the, what I would call the first generation of infrastructure as code tools. So, that would be you know, Terraform, Ansible, Puppet, Chef. Um, you can get kind of in the weeds and, and differentiate between infrastructure and code and configuration as code, but I mean, it's not too important for the, the purposes of this talk. Um, but these tools have pretty much a common problem. They require knowledge of DSLs. So, in this particular example, this is Terraform. So you can see that we're creating a database here. We're specifying the engine, and so you can see it's MySQL, uh, the version, the instance class, you know, the size of the actual database itself. Um, then we're providing a Lambda function here, you know, specifying the, the function name, file name, the handler, the runtime. And so now here's an, yet another language that you have to learn, another syntax that you have to learn. And these things have limitations. The control flow can be pretty complicated, right? If you need to do loops in, in Terraform, Terraform's language, forget about it. It's just not fun. Um, modularity can also be quite challenging. If you have to break up your infrastructure into reusable components, sometimes the way these, these DSIs require you to do that are fairly limiting and not fun to work with. And so according to this approach, let's just use code. Let's throw away the DSIs and let's just use what we're all used to. So if you're a .NET developer, you might be using C-sharp. And this is kind of a little demo of what Pulumi looks like. If you're a Pythonista, perhaps you're using a little bit of Python. Or if you're like one of us in this fold, we're probably using TypeScript or JavaScript. And so we get all the benefits of code that we get from building our applications, IntelliSense, autocomplete. We get all these benefits that you sometimes won't get with DSLs. Sometimes the, the VS Code extensions are buggy. Um, oftentimes, if you search for these infrastructure in, as code tools you know, on the VS Code extensions, you'll see it's like two stars, three stars. The reviews are crap. The tools are crap. But if it's code, you don't have to worry about this stuff. And so, could use it. Well, if you're the only developer on staff and you don't have any operations people, probably. Otherwise, if your operations folk don't really know development, it might not be the right tool, right? You don't really want to have your operations guys learn a programming language on top of all the other things that they're already doing. And so if it's just you or your operations, operations team is very strong in programming, go for it. This is the correct choice. So let's dive into some demos. Oops. All right. So let's go into our second demo here, which is going to be pretty much an extension of what we just did. We're going to deploy a Got it, right but we're going to use it with Polymy. So let's take a look at what that code looks like. So as we see here, we've got a couple things going on. So we're actually defining our bucket here. So I don't have to remember how I created it because I wrote this code, you know, a week ago, and it's still here. It's not, it hasn't gone anywhere. We can see that we're configuring some ACLs. We're making the the bucket the, the bucket public, which was the part that I forgot how to do, which is quite easy in Polymy. It's just one line. We're specifying that the index HTML is going to be the static you know, page that we're going to serve. And then we're defining another thing here, uh, which is a nicety from the from the Pulumi uh, folks. They have this synced folder package, which its entire purpose is taking a bucket, taking a path on your workstation, and syncing it. That's the whole premise. It's going to see what has changed. 
it's going to upload all the things that have changed when you go through with this. Um, and it's pretty handy for, for deploying things to S3. And then at the very end here, we're exporting a site URL. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth into what Pulumi.interpolate here is doing, um, but suffice it to say, there's a couple of utility methods that you need to use um, just based on the way that Pulumi works. Um, you, you can't just interpolate the outputs of certain resources in Pulumi. Uh, you have to use the helpers because a lot of these things are based on promises. There's a lot of deferred execution of these resources. Uh, Pulumi does it, the work of actually creating these things behind the scenes so that it can figure out what it has to be created first, what can be done in parallel. And so there's a couple of things you do have to give up, but the benefits for it are immense. All right, so let's bring this guy up. Do that. All we run is Pulumi up. It's going to output what it's going to do. And so we can see here that it's going to be creating a stack. So you can see that in our code, we didn't define a stack, but Pulumi is going to create one for us anyway. Uh, what a stack is, is just a instance of your resources. So your one Pulumi program, you might want to use for your dev environment, you might want to use for a QA environment. And so a stack is basically the representation of each environment. And then we can see that it's going to be creating a bucket for us. We can see the synced folder stuff is here. And a couple other things that we didn't specify, but the sync folder is doing for us. It has looked at what the file, what files are on disk, and it can see that it has to create those bucket objects. And then we get our output, which is going to be the URL of where we're hosting everything. So let's tell Plumy that we're ready to go. Good to upload. And so it's going to go through and actually start creating these things. And it gave us back a URL. So just like before, we can click it, and we've got our static app up on AWS. And then we can even go back into S3. Take a look, and we'll see that our bucket has also been created for us. Sweet. All right. So let's go into something a little bit more complicated, because we're not always just building static web apps. Sometimes we're building actual applications that need and have multiple features in them. Uh, in this particular example, we're going to take a little net application. Yes. Sure, no problem. So it is this uh, synced bucket folder object. So you specify uh, the bucket here on line 14 that you want to upload into, and then also your local path on your computer. Yep, yep, yep. So it took what was in this and, and put it up there. So it will detect the changes and then basically apply just what has changed. So I won't re-upload everything. It's going to be a little bit more intelligent about that. All right, so we've got two things going on here. We've got an app folder and an info folder. So let's first take a look at the app folder. Let's see what our application looks like. So this is a little serverless function that we built that's basically going to do some database things. So we're importing some AWS SDKs for DynamoDB. Um, if you've ever used DynamoDB, I'm sorry, because it is another thing. <laughs> And so we can see that there's, in our handler function here, we're taking in a table name from environment variables here. So the application doesn't necessarily know what the table that we're going to create will be called. So this is a pretty standard way uh, to pass it through environment variables so that it can know that way. And then here's the actual update command that we're going to do. So we can see that we're doing some stuff with hits. You know, if the hits don't exist, we're going to default to zero. Otherwise, we're going to increment, and we're going to increment by one. Cool. So we've got a little hit counter there when we're going to be increasing. And then we can see we actually send the command, and then we return the actual response from this function. And we say status code 200, everything's good, and we're returning the actual hits object. So let's also take a look at the infrastructure behind all this. So just like before, put in a program, we've got our DynamoDB table that we're creating. You know, we're specifying a couple of attributes in it in a, little, a billing mode, sure, sure. And then there's a little bit of IAM craft. Um, if you ever used AWS, you might be familiar with the roles and permissions and policies that are um, pervasive in it. And so there's a little bit of this that always kind of has to happen. Um, what this is really doing is just giving our uh, application, our serverless function, access to make a couple actions to DynamoDB. So in this particular case, we're letting it you know, update items, put items, get items, um, and then we're telling it which resource that it can actually operate on. And so what's cool about this is that we're actually passing this app data table into this policy object, and we're saying that this uh, arm, which is basically a unique identifier for that table, that's what the policy should act on. And so just by virtue of doing this, 
uh, Pulumi now knows that in order to create this policy, it's first going to have to create the DynamoDB table. And so it's all sort of implicit, and it keeps track of what objects you're passing in, into what. And then we've got an actual Lambda function here. We're assigning the role. And just like before, this means that Pulumi now knows the role has to be created before the, the, before the function can be. We're also specifying the runtime. This time we're using node, sure. And then there are some niceties here that Pulumi also gives you, similar to the synced folder, where in order to create an, a Lambda function in AWS, you actually have to feed it an archive of your code, a zip file effectively. And so Pulumi has got this little helper where it can just create an archive for you when you specify what the path should be. So we're basically just telling it whatever's in this app folder, it's going gonna, it's gonna to zip it up and it's going to upload it. And then we're also specifying our handler, which just basically means we're going to execute our index JS methods handler that we were exporting in our application. And then here's that magic that informs our application for what table is actually being used. So again, we are just directly passing that app data table that we created above. We're passing its name straight into it as an environment variable. And then sometimes there are escape patches where if Pulumi can't necessarily infer um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you do have to tell it what needs to be created first. So there are a couple of escape patches you can utilize. Here we're specifying that the policy has to be created before the Lambda is. Cool. And then the very last thing that we're creating here is a function URL, which by default, Lambdas aren't publicly accessible. There's no URL for, with which to hit them on. And so this is just creating one for us, and it's saying that the authorization should be none. And again, we're passing the function in, and Plumi is going to first. No, it has to create the function before the URL. Sure, sure. And then lastly, we are exporting this app URL from our Pulumi application. And so all of your exports in these applications, they become outputs. So anytime you actually deploy something with Pulumi, it will let you know what that output was, but it'll also store it in its own database. So if you ever come back to it and you're, you don't remember what URL it created, there are CI commands you can run to actually get that output later on. So let's bring this up. Let me up. It's creating this the dev stack for us. It's going to be creating all those things that we saw. The row, the table. It's going to give us our little output, and let us. We're going to let it do its thing. Hopefully, this will be quick. One potato, two potato. Almost there. Usually it's a little bit quicker than this, but I'm going to blame the Wi-Fi. All right, so we're up and running, and we've got our app URL. Let's hit it. We should get one hit, do a couple more refreshes, three hits, five hits, seven hits, just like we thought it would, it would work from the code. And then we can take a look in DynamoDB, take a look at the tables. We find our app data table that's been created. We can look at the items in there, and we can see our hit counter is there. So if we go back, refresh a couple of times, once we'll your hit counter go up, goes up to 15, we run our query, 15 hits. Pretty cool. All right, so now we're going to do something that might be uh, a little bit illegal if you're an infrastructure as code fan. Um, so Paluma has this interesting functionality where you really can just blur the lines bef between your applications and your infrastructure where your infrastructure can just become your applications. So this demo is going to be the same exact type of application. We're going to have a hit counter. We're going to have a DynamoDB table. But there's no application this time. It's only Pulumi. And so if we take a look at what's going on here in the code, we can see that our client SDK that we're importing is actually here in the Pulumi application. We've got our DynamoDB table just like before. And this time, we're going to be doing something a little bit different because we have to use an API gateway. To, to create this sort of thing. You can't just use a Lambda and feed it code directly. Um, there's a couple of limitations. Some of these are AWS things, some of these are Pulumi. Um, but you can see that we've got our path that we're specifying here. We're just going to say at the root, there's an HTTP get that you can do, and here's the code that's going to run. And it's our application code in this Pulumi application, in this little event handler. And so this is going to do the same exact thing as before. But what, what's really interesting about this is that Pulumi is actually going to extract this code all of its dependencies, all of its node modules, it's going to figure out what it needs to actually upload this code into AWS. You don't have to worry about that. And so 
that's pretty powerful. And also, your operations folk probably won't be happy about that. But it is cool. So let's do the same thing. Let's bring it up. Just like before, pulling me up is always the command to bring things up. And if you're wondering, there's also pulling me down in case you ever wanted to bring down your infrastructure. And so we've got a lot more going on here. We've got our API gateway that it's going to be creating. And there's a lot more that it's going to be creating for us that we didn't do. This is the magic that it's doing for us. So it's going to be creating all the roles and policies that we saw before. It's going to be creating some REST APIs, some deployments, some permissions, some stages. Sure. We're going to hit yes. And hopefully this demo actually goes through because I had a little bit of trouble with this one in my, my runs, but I'm sure that because this is a live demo, it will go perfectly fine. And as it's doing this, So it's like, yeah, go for this. Yes. Yes. So this is 100% a feature that they actually, yeah, they, they mark it as, as a killer feature of Pulumi. Um, and, and in fact, it goes much further because it's not just this API gateway that you can do this with. Um, there's a lot of event driven things that you can also do. So if you have queues, if you have buckets, if you want to be notified on events when things are uploaded into the bucket, you can actually hook up event handlers within your Pulumi application, which then you just write your application code right there. And so it's pretty powerful. All right, we found a CRL. Let's hit it. Let me see, we've got our hit counter just like before. Let me go back to DynamoDB, take a look at the tables, do a little refresh. We'll see that one of these is the new one. I don't remember which one. Oh, right, that one, because it's lower. And so what's actually interesting about this is that we created the same named object in AWS, but you can see that Pulumi actually appended a little hash little unique code to the end of this. Um, that's actually something that you can turn off in Pulumi if you want, um, but, it, but it's pretty nice because then you can have multiple applications trying to deploy the same name thing and you don't have to worry about conflicts or anything like that when things need to be unique. And now let's talk about the bread and butter of Pulumi. Um, what, what I honestly believe is the killer feature that differentiates this from other tools that use DSLs um, and it will be composability. So this is going to be another demo where we're deploying a static app, but this time we've got this little Pulumi component resource thing going on. So what this is, is just defining your own type of Pulumi resource that you can just new up. Just like the bucket we saw before, just like the sync folder we saw before, you can now new up this static app. We can see that it's going to have a site URL output. And then the constructor, it's going to do basically the same thing that it was doing before. It's going to create a bucket for us. The only little bit of magic that we have to do is just inform Pulumi that the parent will be this, this new static object that we're going to be creating. Um, and this is how Pulumi maintains that uh, child parent relationship that you see when it's deploying these things. You can see that the stack is the parent, the API is the child. That's the magic that makes all this work. Just like before, there's going to be another S3 folder sync that we're going to do. And just like before, we're going to have that output. And so this is what that looks like. Now, instead of just manually creating those separate resources, now we just new up a static app and it's gonna do the same thing for us. So let's do it, pull me up. Mostly it's gonna create the same things we saw before in the second demo. And I've been thinking a little bit more what it's doing. There we go, now it knows it needs to create those things. So yes, we do want to. And so now rather than having to copy paste, you know, what was it, eight lines of code, now it's just one. You know, if I want another static app, I can just duplicate this as much as I want. But here comes the real power. Let's say I wanted three of these, hundreds of these. I didn't want to copy paste this 103 you know, times. Instead, we can just do a loop. No problem. So we can see that we're going to be keeping track of a couple of app URLs. And then we're going to do a loop. We're going to create a couple of static apps this time, not just once. We're going to push that URL to that, that array that we're keeping track of. And then we're going to return it just like we did before so that Plumi can tell us what that was. So now that we just made a little bit of an infrastructure change to this existing project, we can do Plumi up again. And Plumi will know that a static app that we deployed the first time, it's already up there. It doesn't have to create it again. And so you can actually see in the resources here, 24 that it's going to create, three that are unchanged. Right? The first time we deployed it, nothing has changed except for these new you know, duplicated static apps that we're not going to deploy. We hit yes. It's going to do its magic. And then at the end, we will get three URLs 
for three hour apps. So very powerful because the the level at which this this type of control flow happens in Pulumi is done outside of your resources. Um, a lot of the, the DSLs, like Terraform, for example, their language requires you to loop within a resource. It's kind of hard to say, oh, I've got these you know, five things I want to create, and I want to create 20 of them. Right? Instead, you have to go into the language of each one and say, for each within this resource, and for each within the next resource, for each within the next resource, and it gets really wordy. It's not fun. This, in my eyes, as a developer, just makes sense. I don't have to think about it. It's just a for loop. I'm creating three things. It's, it's awesome. All right. So the ecosystem. Like I said, there's a lot that's going on in Pulumi. There's a lot of things that, um, a lot of different plugins you can use, a lot of providers. It's not just clouds, right? It, it, there are a lot of cloud support. You know, there's a lot of AWS, Google Cloud, if you're a Google fan. And there's also things like, you know, you'll see DigitalOcean, Docker, um, GitHub, GitLab. So there's providers that can actually create things within GitHub for you. So instead of manually creating GitHub repos, GitHub projects, organizations, just let Pulumi do it. Define it in your infrastructure's code files once, and then you never have to think about it. Any questions? Yes. Like Google, I mean, it's all like personal project today, much easier now. However, to say this out, I was like, now it now it looks like it needs tests. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, is that a, maybe that's a dumb question, but because you have like not just the loop, but you've got like like structural components being. I mean, you've got stuff going on there. So, yeah. I, and I know you run the little command and you see like a, like a preview of what's going to happen. Great, but I can imagine this is in this even any other scenario. It's just code that's going to run automatically when it is triggered by merge to master or whatever. Yeah. Did you get a right test? I mean, you get right. <laughs> but you can. Um, testing is actually first class within Pulumi. Um, you know, I would argue that if your infrastructure is very complicated, you might want to write tests, even if it just feels weird, right? You might want to enforce certain things that you have certain amounts of CPU, certain amounts of RAM, you know, whatever your configuration might be. Um, you might want to enforce that, or your operation staff might want to enforce that. And so that's part of that testing methodology. You can write, um, there's two layers of tests. I don't remember their exact names, but it, there's the policy enforcement and then also basically mocking to make sure you're creating the right resources. And so you can, but you don't have to. Um, the other thing is that Pulumi bet, well, Pulumi does also support YAML. There is a YAML language provider for Pulumi where you can, just like you saw with, you know, in code, you can define your infrastructure as YAML. Um, I haven't looked at it much because you probably lose control flow, or if you do get control flow in your for loops and whatnot, they're probably not pretty again. And import it and bring it in, and then I'm like, oh, this needs to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you said, the blurring of the lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you, you use AN as an example. Uh, would something like, would it work with something like, say, Vercel? Um, maybe. Um, I don't actually know if they're the uh, Vercel provider. Um, we can maybe take just a quick look in their registry and just control F Vercel. Try filtering. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, and and probably the rationale for that is because Vercel usually has its own deployment model. It's more based on your Git repo, and you know you're pushing to a branch, which is then triggering some deployments. Um, and Vercel usually manages your infrastructure for you, so you don't have to think about it. Um, that would be why they probably don't have a provider. It just probably doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would just use Vercel's tools, let, let them do whatever they're going to do to deploy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, CloudFlare has got a ton of features. Um, CloudFlare is kind of crazy. There's a lot of things you might want want to provision as an infrastructure's code, like DNS records and, and things like that. Um, yes. Good question. So uh, the CLI and everything we just saw is completely free. It's an open source. I believe it's MIT licensed. Um, so you don't. There's no. There's no cost. Um, the way Plumi actually does make their money is that. Um, when it comes to all of these infrastructures code tools, they have to store state somewhere. Basically, their own internal representation of what they think has been uploaded into the cloud, they have to store that somewhere. So you can use Pulumi's own cloud to store it. So that you have to pay for. And then at that point, you get, get into um, pricing per user and things like that. But Pulumi also lets you just store it within an S3 bucket. A you know, little bit of a chicken egg problem there, because then you have to create S3 bucket manually to store your infrastructure, but but you can do it. Um, and then they also have a local provider, so you can store state locally on a server somewhere, like a you know a VM in your own network, those sorts of things. So it's a state, basically. It's it, yeah, it's it's going to be proprietary, like whatever Pulumi's like internal representation of your infrastructure, whatever files they're using. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, it's gibberish basically like it's it's going to be all of the identifiers that came back from aws so that it knows like this thing links to this thing in the cloud basically it's it's how it keeps track of what it has deployed and what has it has not and so it's i've, I've seen the files there are some json files in there um they're not really readable it's just you know identifiers galore Well, for, right. or, or yes, or just leave it alone because you don't usually have to worry about it. You just have to store it somewhere and then pray that, you know, Pulumi never breaks things, right? But we always have to kind of trust the tools we're using. So, all right. Any other questions? Kick off. Okay. GitOps, yep. Yep. Questions. We can kick this off just, just well today. Um, so GitOps, I'd have to think about a bit because I, I have used Flux, not Argo, um, which is a, it's a similar tool in that ecosystem. Um, those are usually more tailored to Kubernetes types of deployments where you've got your, your YAML that sort of defines your infrastructure, and then you've got some sort of controller in your Kubernetes cluster that's reaching out to your YAML to see that, has it changed. And if it has changed, like you're deploying another app, you've scaled something up, then it will make the relevant change in the Kubernetes cluster. So I don't know exactly how Pulumi fits into that sort of scenario. Um, I do know that Pulumi can uh, define Kubernetes resources. So your services, your pods, your, your, your applications, whatever it might be, you can define those actually. Rather than Kubernetes YAML, you can do it in Pulumi if you want, or in Pulumi YAML if you're a monster. <laughs> um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Please enjoy the complimentary cat tax. <laughs>